our study uh, today is entitled Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. And I want to look at this topic uh, relating, of course, to joy in Jesus from the perspective that uh, today we have so much happening around us in the world. If you hear the news, especially, uh, there is plenty of reason not to be joyful. There is actually very little to be happy about. If you watch the news, you see what's going on. Uh, we hear of all kinds of tragedies, uh, death, turmoil, riots, pain, suffering, and a pervading sense of fear throughout all of this. Fear of the virus, fear of the restrictions, fear of uh, the future, uh, what it will hold, fear of the mandates that are being enacted, fear of uncertain outcomes soon upon us, fear of uh, the outcome of the elections or all kinds of issues and things that are occurring around us. Uh, fear of more trouble, fear of what, what else might happen that we didn't expect and we didn't prepare for. And uh, in this environment, in this atmosphere, you find that there's actually very little that brings joy, especially if you're watching the news, you follow the, you know, on the internet, the, the latest headlines, what's going on. Uh, if that's where you're looking anyway, there's very little to bring joy, to bring gladness, to bring certainty and to bring assurance. Inversely to this picture, we actually have what the scripture presents, uh, specifically in particular passage, we're gonna look at it briefly and a number of other passages, but in Psalm 16, in Psalm 16, this is a Psalm about the resurrection of Jesus and uh, about the experience of Jesus. And through this Psalm, we actually find that Jesus was going through a deadly trial. So it's not like he was going through a happy, joyful time. He was going through a deadly trial. And this is where he looked and this is the result of it. Let's look at that together. Uh, Psalm 16 and verse uh, 11 is what we want to look at. And here it is, Psalm 16, 11. It says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So, beautiful passage here. Jesus is talking about this, and this thought was on his mind as he was facing death. It actually says that in the previous verse, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, in death. And through this experience, through this severe trial, Jesus was able to say, he could look and say, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. It's interesting that despite the circumstances that Jesus was surrounded with, death, uh, suffering, misery, his very own death, he actually was able to look forward to something. He was able to look to God. He was able to see that in his presence is fullness of joy. And that affected his outlook, his mindset, his faith, and therefore his experience. Very beautiful lesson for us today. And this is, what I, this is what I want to spend some time looking at today. Because in the scriptures, there are many, many instructions and injunctions to be joyful. Hundreds and hundreds of verses. We're not going to go through them all today. We'll go through some. But uh, you, it makes you wonder, why do you think there's so much instruction? It's because God knows what we will face and what we will experience in this world. And it's like we need a reminder. And let me tell you something. You don't get that reminder from watching the news. You don't get this reminder by looking at all the trouble and woes in the world. As a matter of fact, the more you look at these things, sometimes the more apprehension, the more fear, and the more uncertainty they plant in our minds. Uh, and that's from the little that we know of some of these plans that seem to be happening. You see the police did this here, or the governments did that there, or some people, rioters did this and the other thing, and something's getting closer to us. What's going to happen? This is the picture you get. And so God knows this. And so he says, listen, let me remind you of something and these constant instructions of joy. Joy is a, is a bit of a rare commodity these days. Uh, fear is, is the common. Fear is the, is the more widespread virus than joy. Uh, sorry, than the coronavirus. Fear is the more widespread virus. But what about joy? It seems to be scarce. It seems to be rare. So today, like I said, I want to look at it because joy uh, doesn't just come about because we choose to, oh, I'll be joyful. It's not something you put on. It's not something you manufacture. Joy is directly related, actually, to where you are looking. What is in your field of vision? What is, what registers on your radar, so to speak? What occupies your thinking? What occupies your, uh, you know, your thought process? Uh, what do you converse of? This is the subject matter that occupies your vision, and whatever it might be, it will influence whether you are joyful or whether you are uncertain, doubtful, fearful, or whatever it might be. So this is, the, this is the challenge today. Because joy is really a religious experience. It's not just 
feeling happy. It's not just what we're talking about. It's, it's so much deeper and so much more than just feeling happy. Joy is a calling. It's actually part of our walk and it's a blessing and a privilege in our spiritual experience that many times goes by neglected. And so I want to remind each and every one of us of that today. Uh, too often, it's because we're not looking where we should. That's many times the reason. And so let's spend some time looking at that. True joy is only found in one place. Here it is. Jesus says it. True joy, uh, its location is really in one place. In John 15 and verse 11, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So joy can only be found in Christ. True joy, true biblical joy can only be found in Christ. Because as we read earlier in the psalm, in thy presence is fullness of joy. We can only experience without Christ, maybe partial joy, uh, sporadic joy here and there, but uh, true biblical full joy is in Christ himself. Now, this, this uh, verse points out two aspects here. I don't want us to miss. First of all, Jesus says he spoke these things. He says that my joy might remain in you. So he's the source, it's his joy, and his desire is his joy might remain in us. And then it becomes very personal because the rest of the verse, it says, and that your joy might be full. So he says, it's my joy. It remains in you that then your joy will be full. In other words, the joy of Jesus is personalized. It becomes ours. And the only way it becomes ours is if we have the source of that joy, Christ himself within. That's where we're looking. This is who we are aware of his presence. And that would produce and that would generate this joy, which is his, that becomes ours personally. So it's not joy that we manufacture to try and copy or try and imitate. It's his joy. It's personalized and becomes ours in having him. This is an important factor, important point to keep in mind. So my question to you and me today is this. How is your joy? Hopefully, based on this verse now, you understand what I mean. How is your joy? How is your attitude? How is your outlook on life? How is your outlook on the future? Look, I'll be honest, I confess to you, uh, looking at the news, many times I get a certain sense of apprehension and I feel like I lose this sense of joy, calm, peaceful assurance. And, uh, you know, like it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I don't feel like all pleasures forevermore uh, when I look at the things that are happening in the world. And so this is the question, where are you looking? And how is our vision affecting our attitude and therefore our experience, our walk? You see, our walk with Jesus is not one of doom and gloom and uncertainty. Despite uh, how many people seem to give that impression who profess the name of Jesus. The question to you and me is, are we one of those? Jesus wants his joy to remain, not to disappear, not to vanish, not to be eroded away by things and troubles and trials in the world. He wants it to remain so that our joy and our experience might be full. That's a lot fuller than just being happy for a season or being you know, happy about something or other or even putting on a happy front. So if you're struggling in that department, in that area, uh, I want to challenge you with this thought. Where have you been looking lately? How is your vision? What is occupying your thinking. Another place where Jesus says it is a little later in the same book, John 17 and verse 3. Notice how he puts it here. And now come I to thee, speaking to the Father, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Here it is. Jesus spells that very clearly. My joy fulfilled in themselves. Listen, this was so important that Jesus actually prayed about it. It was part of his prayer to his Father before he left. He knew what the disciples would go through, trial, tribulation, heartache. He says, my peace I give to you, but not just peace. He says, joy as well. And not, kind, not any joy, the joy that would be fulfilled in themselves. Not just joy theoretically, not just joy as an idea. Joy that is experienced. That's what it means when it says fulfilled in them. So joy is a characteristic of our faith. That should be pretty plain and, and clear by now. Joy is a, is a feature and a characteristic of our faith. Is this the case? with you day by day? That's the question. Is this the case for me day by day? Is this the case for us collectively day by day? Are we known for our joyful experience and attitude? I'm not saying this, this uh, flamboyant, you know, shallow, uh, happy-go-lucky type of attitude. No, a true biblical joy, fulfillment of the joy of Christ 
as part of our experience that characterizes us when people think of us. What, what do people think of when they think of you? They think, oh, yeah, a, that guy who complains all the time. Oh, this sister is always down. Oh, yeah, this, they're depressed. If you talk to them, they depress me too. How are you considered in other people's minds? What, in other words, what effect, what influence do you give? Jesus wants joy to be a characteristic of the experience of his people. Not any joy. He says, listen, I'm going to give it to you. It's my joy. It'll be fulfilled in you. So, Remember, part of looking to Christ is to receive that joy. Let's not forget that. So where have you been looking? Where am I looking? Because, like I said, this is not something that we manufacture. This is a, a fruit. This is a byproduct of the presence of Jesus. And so he desires that because he knows we are changed by beholding. He desires for us to look to him to receive his joy. Now, what does joy mean practically? I want to look at some practical aspects because I'm not just talking about cheerfulness and, and you know, uh, calm, delight, and happiness, like we're saying. Uh, these aspects are all part of joy, that's true, but there is a deeper component. Uh, joy has an element of strength in it. Let's look at this verse in Nehemiah chapter uh, 8 and verse 10. And notice in this story how Nehemiah encouraged the people. Nehemiah 8 and verse 10. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So, here is Nehemiah encouraging the people with the joy of the Lord, and he reminds them of a, an attribute and a characteristic of the joy of the Lord. It's not just feeling happy, it's actually strength. He says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, guess what? When you're not feeling... Uh, very joyful. Uh, it's an indication that there is a certain weakness there. When you're feeling doubtful, down, depressed, uh, uncertain, fearful of the future, that these are all expressions of a weakness. Now, I'm not saying this to condemn people. Because most of the time, we recognize that. Here, Nehemiah says, listen, the joy of the Lord is actually not just about feeling good. There's also strength in it. So this is an important formula to keep in mind. The joy of the Lord, the joy of Jesus, is strength. I want us to keep the, this formula in mind. Because having Christ is uh, not just, you know, about being salvation, and uh, receiving salvation. That's all good and well. But there's an experience that is part of that salvation. That sometimes we miss. And we, we, we miss out on the strength that comes from that because we don't think of it that way. Or we're looking at the wrong place too often. Things that take the place of Christ in our field of vision, things that occupy our mind more than Christ, and they drive away the joy of the Lord. And in essence, they really drive away our strength, which is the strength that comes from the Lord. So joy, uh, the joy of Jesus is strength, power and strength in the joy that comes from the Lord. Because guess what? I think we all know, but I want to remind you, we're in a spiritual battle, brothers and sisters. We fight with forces of darkness. We fight with sin, temptation, trial. And we, re we need to remember that part of our warfare in this fight, one of the weapons that God gives us is joy. We don't just fight with what's going to happen in the world, how close are things are going to come to us as far as, uh, you know, these troubles and trials that are growing in the world. There is a spiritual battle that is much more intense and more serious, and its effects are a lot more lasting. How are we faring in this battle? One of the weapons that God gives us in this battle is his very own joy. His joy is strength. Now, we need to be skillful in using this weapon because not only does joy make the journey sweeter, but it actually has a power to defeat the enemy of darkness. Now, notice how else the scripture puts that. A number of passages here, and I want to look at it from this perspective. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11, here is how Paul puts it. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. There you go. So we're strengthened with all might. God gives us strength, might, in order to be patient, in order to endure uh, long suffering. And then there is a component here that many times is strangely missing with joyfulness. Sometimes we endure with complaining, sometimes we are long suffering with doubt. And, uh, you know, or, or we just, well, I hope this passes soon. I don't know when this will be over. Lord, why am I going through this trouble? trouble? And we, we groan and moan and we complain and we tell everybody how this is not a fun experience or not a fun thing or, oh, my trial is so difficult and, and, and bad. And, and you know what ends up happening? We make matters so much worse for ourselves than they need to be. 
Now, I'm not trying to downplay or diminish someone's trial. We all go through trials and some people's trials are very severe. I'm not trying to diminish it or downplay, it. but our attitude many times can make the trial more severe or it can actually enable us to pass through it with long suffering and joyfulness. What, what, what do I mean by that? Our attitude or our vision, our spiritual vision, where are we looking? Are we remembering that this is a spiritual weapon? This is not just here, this is something to have fun with, something to enjoy life with. No, it's actually a serious and practical weapon. Now, let me show you uh, the, the inverse of that as well. And uh, as we're going through, I want to keep asking the, the question, are you like that? Are you one of those people that is, you know, strengthened with all might, with, uh, with patience and long-suffering, but also with joyfulness. Because uh, we read earlier that uh, in God's presence is fullness of joy. If you, read, uh, if you remember, we looked at Psalm 16, uh, Christ there through the psalmist says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Now think about it this way. The inverse of that is also true. And this becomes a little bit alarming, but I want to express it. Therefore, Satan's presence the opposite of God's presence. If in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. So Satan's presence, there is what? The absence of joy. Consider that. Satan hates true joy. So the question is, are you joyful? Or in other words, whose presence are you in? Or whose presence do you allow to fill you or surround you? In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. Satan's presence is the opposite of that. There is the absence of joy. There is fear. There is uh, panic. There is turmoil. There is doubt. There is uncertainty. There is everything but joy. We're focusing on one component today, joy. So joy is strength. And this is what I'm saying. In God's presence, joy is strength. The absence of that means weakness. How is your walk? How is your outlook? Where do you stand today? Joy is a serious thing. So let me look at this example here, again, from the Old Testament. Let's see what God told the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 45 to 47. Notice carefully here. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Interesting. God says these curses will come upon you. He's speaking to Israel under the old covenant. But one of the reasons here is not only that they were disobedient, but he says, because in verse 47, you didn't serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart. You know what that means? That you can be obedient and be miserable doing it. You can have a wrong attitude. Say, well, I'll obey God. You know, I'll, I'll follow God even if he kills me, Lord. You know what? And I'm verbalizing it a little bit, you know, uh, in a little bit raw form. Some people will not say that. But this is many times an attitude. God says, listen, what this will do is it will bring about a curse upon you. If you forget, if you don't realize, if you neglect to use this weapon and serve the Lord with joyfulness and gladness, it will end up causing a curse upon you. Not that God's going to be angry with you and bam, you know, uh, curse you. No, that attitude brings, generates weakness and defeat in the experience of spiritual things. This is the point, And this is what it's uh, talking about. Notice the next verse, what, what the effect, what the result of that. This is on Israel physically, but we want to learn the spiritual lesson from the physical experience of Israel. Here's the next verse, verse 48. It says, therefore, Shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. So notice what, what happens here. Defeat. Defeat for Israel, serving their enemies because they do not serve the Lord God with gladness and joyfulness of heart. That's a serious thing. Now, let's make the parallel today. Uh, today, brothers and sisters, we are also in a battle. Are we serving the Lord with joyfulness and gladness of heart? Or are we serving the Lord out of a sense of duty and obligation? And we have to, and this is what we must, and the law says, and God requires it, and he said it, I obey it. How is our attitude in that? How is our attitude in serving the Lord? Many times we serve the Lord without joyfulness and gladness of heart, if we were honest. And here, this was the cause for Israel's defeat against their enemies. So are you having defeat in your battle and in your struggle with spiritual forces of darkness, with sin, Satan, temptation, trial? Or are you having 
victory. What makes a huge difference is how you serve the Lord. Where are you looking? Is the joy of the Lord your strength or are you simply running in your own strength? Therefore, it's not a joyful experience for you. It's a miserable endurance. And quite frankly, the way you look at, uh, you look at some people's experience and what comes out of their mouth, you realize that their Christian journey seems like a heavy, toilsome burden that they are enduring as if they are doing God some big favor by, by you know, following his instructions. I'm, I'm just being honest. Some people express with their mouth what attitude they have in their heart and what's going on in their soul and reveal the color of their experience. How is it with you? How is it with me? How do we fare with our spiritual enemies? So that's why we're saying the formula is joy. So Jesus in his presence is fullness of joy. Joy is strength. Christ's presence is strength, spiritual strength. Now, this is not just a, a, a metaphor. This is not just a cliche that we say with our words. I say, yeah, the strength. And then we go and try and pretend to be joyful. We smile when we don't feel like it. We try and uh, have a happy uh, attitude when in reality on the inside, it's anything but. No, it needs to be genuine, true recognition that God's presence, the presence of Christ, his spirit truly produces joy that actually genuinely is experienced by us so this is not to make beliefs because sometimes people you know will read this and, and and treat it as an instruction so you say okay i just gotta smile more uh no the smile needs to be an accurate portrayal of what's on the inside and this long suffering and patience with joyfulness is many times how the battle is won spiritually so no wonder repeatedly in the bible we are told to be joyful. God reminds us of this because we are prone to forget. And like I said, sometimes in the world, especially today, you can be surrounded by so much stuff that causes us to lose sight of this true joy. And when it says be joyful, this countless instruction about being joyful. In other words, if you if you understand the formula here, it's simply saying be strong in Jesus. When it's every time the word says be joyful, it means be strong because the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's only found in Christ. Now, I want to look at a couple of uh, stories here. To illustrate this in a practical way, because uh, it's, it's nice to keep things practical, uh, there are two aspects of joy here I want to explore together today in the, in the time we have left. Two aspects, two practical applications and, and aspects of joy. Uh, it's kind of like a sword, like a spiritual sword. Uh, that's kind of how I, I like to think of it. And this is a double-edged sword, okay? So one edge and the other edge. So it cuts both ways. It cuts uh, on both sides. Uh, in this, this spiritual weapon that we're kind of uh, visualizing here together. And we'll look at both sides or two components of it and how we can utilize it. What's actually involved in it practically? So joy, what, what, what does that mean? You know, I don't, have, I don't feel joyful. Okay, I hear what you're saying. I know that this is what the Bible says. Jesus says, well, what does it practically mean? I don't feel it. Okay, I, you can say it all you like. You can repeat the verses all you like. Someone might say, I, I, just, don't, I just don't feel it. Well, let's look at practically what that actually means in day-to-day -day, uh, application. The first edge of the sword or part or side one is uh, mentioned in Psalm 33. Let's have a look at this one. Uh, Psalm 33 and verse one is our next verse. It says, rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Here it is. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. This is God's people, talking about God's people. For praise is comely for the upright. This is joy in action. What's that talking about? Praise is an aspect of joy, according to this verse. Rejoicing and praising it says praise is comely for the upright why because this person is rejoicing he's praising the lord because he has been made righteous in his presence in god's presence his fullness of joy how is that joy practically revealed manifested how is it utilized here it is in praise praising so uh praising the lord in other words uh very simply it kind of would have known you could have guessed that i guess uh, you know easily when we are joyful in the lord we will praise we will rejoice we will uh, give glory to god and what i mean by praise here this is not just a you know as in saying praise the lord every time someone says something no you will actually have a genuine want and desire to express your joy in the lord in praise to him and particularly uh, praise is most often expressed in song we see examples of that let's look at the next uh, Next verse, because that kind of ties that in uh, for us as far as praising and song. Psalms 27, verse 6. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Here is David speaking, singing. 
uh, in this psalm. And he talks about offering sacrifices. And he doesn't talk about offering sacrifices of animals. He talks about offering sacrifices of joy. And then he links that with saying, I will sing. So how is he offering sacrifices of joy? How is he expressing this joy? He's actually singing, singing praises unto the Lord. The Lord was his strength and his song, as he says in another psalm. So singing, singing, praising is a very powerful weapon. There is one edge of this two-edged sword of joyfulness, which is strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Uh, if you think of praise songs and, uh, and rejoicing in that sense, you know, the Bible tells us, and I think we're familiar with this, uh, with this passage, that God inhabits the praises of his people. I'll look at it in, in one minute, but uh, I want us to remember this, this thing. Singing, brothers and sisters, is not just something we do before worship because it's part of the worship service. Singing is actually a spiritual weapon that is very underused. I want to look at some examples of that. And it is a manifestation of the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, singing. And when I say singing, I don't mean just, you know, humming or, 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 you know, listening to songs. No, you personally, individually, singing, praising, that is an outflow of the joy of the Lord. That's one we say, well, how, how can I be joyful? What, what's that mean? Okay, praise, start singing, see what happens. Here is how the Bible puts it. Uh, Psalm 22. Verse 3, it says, But thou art holy, speaking of God, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. I want you to think about that for a minute. You hear that often, perhaps, you know, in association with singing or before singing. God inhabits the praises of his people. Here it says he inhabits the praises of Israel. There's something about singing that causes a supernatural spiritual experience. Actually, you find it that uh, even in the temple, the dedication back in the days of the Old Testament, when the priests, uh, uh, at one point, they began to sing praises, God's presence came and filled the temple so much, the cloud filled the temple, that they were not able to stay in and they had to go out. And that was a physical manifestation, illustration of God inhabiting the praises of his people. So it's no surprise that David says here, uh, God inhabits the praises of his people. There's something on the spiritual realm, brothers and sisters, that when you praise God, when you sing to God, God's presence and you are fused together. God inhabits the praises of his people and something happens in the spiritual realm that causes strength, that causes victory and the powers of darkness are defeated and they fall back. Now, I'm not talking here about, uh, you know, airy fairy stuff. This is reality. In the spiritual realm, the presence of the Lord, in it is joy. God inhabits the praises of his people. So there is no wonder then that we are admonished to praise and to be joyful. That's part of the weapon uh, or one of the weapons of our warfare, this aspect of joy. Now, the story uh, I'm thinking of, just to illustrate how powerful this is, is the story of Paul and Silas when they were in jail. Let's read this quickly just to recount the details because the details are always interesting. You might remember a story one way. You read the verses, you think, oh, there were some details I forgot in that story. So let's read it. Acts 16, verse 23, 23 to 26. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, that's upon Paul and Silas, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. There is singing, there is God inhabiting the praises of his people, and there is a supernatural event that happened not just in the spiritual realm but now affecting the physical realm and victory was gained over the physical bounds of the prison and the stocks that bound the disciples illustrating the spiritual truth that the bounds that satan tries to put on them to restrict them are broken by them utilizing this weapon they sang in jail now I'm, i don't need to remind you that i'm sure paul and silas they were beaten they were beaten uh, they were put in the inner jail, in the stocks. They would have had plenty of reason and even temptation to wonder what's going on. Lord, why is this happening to us? Weren't we preaching your word? And then this happens to us. Lord, can't you see where we are? Uh, no, you don't hear any of that. You, that's not where their vision was. They were not looking at their immediate surroundings. 
or you know, it doesn't mean that they were ignorant of it, but it didn't register on their radar as the reality of their spiritual vision. It didn't diminish that. It didn't overtake that. Yes, they took stock of that. Yeah, we're aware of what's happening and so on and so forth, but we're looking elsewhere. We know we're in a spiritual battle. And they looked to the Lord in his presence was fullness of joy. The joy of Jesus was fulfilled in them. How was that revealed or manifested? They sang praises to God. At what point? It says here in the verse, they were singing at midnight. At midnight. So at midnight, that's the darkest hour. So this is not just physical, spiritual as well. They are in a dark place spiritually as far as outer appearances go. Now, as we're going through this story, please, please don't forget to draw some parallels to see how is your experience. Can you relate to Paul and Silas? Because guess what? Some of us might actually end up in a circumstance just like them, in a physical jail, physically beaten, cast into the inner prison, or however it might be in this, in this day and age. And we might be going right now, you might be going through a dark experience, some trial that feels like midnight, like black darkness, like you are just bound by circumstances and Lord, what's going on here? Here is Paul and Silas going through such an experience. At midnight, the darkest hour, you know, the middle of the night, they begin to sing praises. Now, the, the beautiful thing about this too, I, I don't want to miss mentioning this, is they, they don't sing, you know, under their breath. They don't hum. They're not humming. They're not just singing softly. They're singing loudly, okay? So uh, that doesn't mean that they're trying to be a nuisance, but they're just joyful and they're, they're just praising God in song. They're singing loudly because we're told here that the other prisoners heard them. The other prisoners actually heard them. Now, who knows if the other prisoners were annoyed, disturbed because they couldn't sleep or troubled. Maybe they were comforted. I don't know. But whatever it is, it didn't last long because all of a sudden the whole prison was shaking and the, whole, the earthquake shook the whole prison. Everyone was free. Everyone was released. The, the, the doors, the walls fell, whatever happened. All of a sudden the singing of Paul and, on Paul and Silas, now whatever it was making them happy or making them depressed or upset, whatever it was, forget that. Now, earthquake happened. A supernatural event. Now, it's interesting that those prisoners would have never forgotten that experience afterwards. It was so impactful that we know this caused the conversion of the jailer. Because when he was, you know, he was about to kill himself and Paul told him, stop, we're all still here. And he asked, what must I do to be saved? Paul told him, him and his household were saved. So Paul and Silas, and this is a beautiful parable, beautiful, powerful story here of the strength of praising God, which is an aspect of the joy of the Lord. Paul and Silas knew this was a spiritual weapon. They used that weapon skillfully and they had an outstanding experience as a result of that. Now I want you to think about that. Can you imagine what might have happened had Paul and Silas not sang? Had they given in to just looking at their surroundings and letting that become their vision, their complete vision, and wondering what's going on, doubtful, uncertain, what does the future hold? Lord, why did you let this happen to us? And if they began to engage in that type of attitude and that type of, of spirit, do you think they would have experienced what happened? I highly doubt it. Brothers and sisters, we're in a spiritual battle. How are you faring? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Jesus is joy. Joy in Jesus equals strength. Jesus wants his joy fulfilled in us. Praising God, singing loudly okay not necessarily loudly as an obnoxiously but loudly singing out loud is is a powerful weapon that satan cannot tolerate he cannot have it opens up the gates for god's presence to come to inhabit the praises of his people and lo and behold an earthquake happened in this particular story we need more earthquakes not physical earthquakes but we need more earthquakes in the spiritual realm of the kingdom of god advancing and moving forward because of the work of his soldiers here on earth spiritual i'm talking about spiritually okay i'm not wishing for more earthquakes in the world there's enough already happening if you follow the news there's plenty and it causes all kinds of turmoil i'm talking about an earthquake in the spiritual realm where the kingdom of darkness thinks that they are winning and gaining ground and oppressing people and even god's people are suffering under them how about god's people rise up use this weapon a little bit more skillfully and cause some earthquakes in the kingdom of darkness and and cause the tide to turn a little bit paul and silas did that and this story is a very very powerful illustration and reminder for that. So they raised their heart in praise and thanksgiving to God and wonders occurred. So here's the thing for you and me. Are you missing out on a supernatural component in your experience because you are neglecting to utilize this weapon? That's the question. Paul and Silas, they could have missed out. They didn't. They understood the battle. Are we missing out? How much are we missing out on because we are 
unskillful, we are neglectful in utilizing this powerful, mighty weapon. Look, there's so much more that goes around as far as complaining, as far as uh, murmuring, as far as doubting, as far as, you know, wondering what's going on. And, and it's like sometimes, you know, people get together and they talk, oh, yeah, this is happy. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, this is hard. This is troubling. This is right. And I don't want to recount specific cases here because my, my point is we need to look up, brothers and sisters. We have so much to praise God for, to sing about. So Paul and Silas was one example. There's another example. And this example is in the Old Testament. It's interesting. One is in the old, one is in the new. And this is of uh, the story of Jehoshaphat, when the children of, du of Judah were outnumbered by the hostile armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Sire. So Jehoshaphat called all the people. They were totally outnumbered as far as the armies were concerned. They, they knew this is this, God's got to do something here because if we go out to battle, we're going to lose. So he calls the people and they gather together and God sends them a prophet. He says, listen, I'm going to be with you in the battle. He tells them how to go out against the army and he tells them he will do the fighting for them. And so he tells them about a very interesting battle formation. He says, you need to go out and you need to sing, send the singers out first. Here's, here's how it puts it. Uh, let's look at this powerful, powerful story. And again, draw some parallels. In Second Chronicles 20 and verse 21. So they follow God's directive. And when he had consulted with the people, that's the king, he appointed singers unto the Lord. And that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. And to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Now, I've got to tell you, that is a strange battle formation from a human perspective. If you go out to battle, here is, here is this army going out against a, a, another, an enemy that outnumbers them. And who does he set at the, at the forefront of the army? Not the strongest men, not the most uh, skillful men. According to God's instruction, he sets the singers, the choir. He sends the choir before the army. What does the choir do? The choir begins to sing and praise the Lord and say, His mercy endureth forever. What a strange battle formation. I wonder what the enemy might have thought looking upon this battle formation. But you know what? They didn't have long to think about it because all of a sudden the tide turned. This is like these prisoners. They didn't have long to think, well, wonder is this song singing good or bad? The tide turned. The enemy was defeated. We know that from the very next verse. Verse 22. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord said ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab and Mount Sair, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. They were smitten, they were scattered, the battle was won. And you know what? Israel did not have to fight in the regular conventional way of strategic army versus army. They fought in God's way. This was a spiritual battle. And God told them what to do. And the weapon that they used was not better swords, sharper swords or chariots of iron. They used the weapon of praise, of singing. And the battle turned because God inhabits the praises of his people. In his presence is fullness of joy. And when they manifested that, when they recognized that, and they followed God and trusted God, the battle was won. You see, when you praise God, going through a trial, it actually demonstrates trust and confidence in God. I want to say that again. When you praise God genuinely, not just because out of, oh, you know, I better do this. We don't really feel. When you truly, genuinely praise God, when you sing praises to God, when you're going through a severe trial, through a battle, outnumbered, it actually is a demonstration of confidence and trust in God. In other words, you're trusting God that the outcome is not going to be as humanly apparent to you. The outcome is going to be a supernatural to what one would normally expect. That's what it, that's what it demonstrates. So this is a very, very powerful enemy, uh, weapon Sorry, that can defeat a very powerful enemy. And it's demonstrated here for us in these two stories. Because if you think about it this way... Uh, when God's people began to sing, the enemy started running. Praise confuses the forces of evil and breaks the hold of Satan on us. You realize that? Praise, singing, confuses the forces of evil and breaks Satan's hold on us. It reminds Satan of something that long ago he used to have and enjoy that he now detests. And when you engage in praise and singing joyfully to God with all your heart, you are causing terror and absolute pain in Satan's head, in the demon's ears. They cannot tolerate it and stand it, and the power of darkness is broken. We've seen it very graphically in these two stories, not just in the spiritual realm, but physically. It was so powerful that it actually spilled over from the spiritual realm into the physical. So Paul and Silas experienced that. They were joy. Satan could just not depress their spirit. 
He beat them. He threw them in jail. He just could not break their spirit. They were just joyful and singing. So they were winning the battle spiritually. And that was so effective. It spilled over into the physical so that an earthquake happened. God says, let's, let's break this. Let's break this prison open for you. Here, here's an earthquake. Shake it out. Go preach. This is, you're winning. Keep, keep moving. God was fighting the battle for them. What were they doing? Utilizing the weapons that God had given. Same story with Judah, Israel. They praised God, trusted in God. God says, no problem. The enemy scattered before them when they sang praises to God. How are you doing? How is your journey? How is your victory when it comes to singing praise to God? This is just one component of this weapon of joyfulness like we're looking at about. You see, we're going, brothers and sisters, into a very serious battle in the world today. Okay, we're, we're facing a prospect of a future. I know, I'm, I'm well aware of what the news says and the discussions we have and the concerns we, we express and all of that stuff. We, we, I'm not going to relay it all. We, the Bible sums it up as a time of trouble such as never was since there was an issue. We're seeing glimpses of it already. The question is, are you ready? Are you equipped for the battle? Are you skillful in using this weapon? Because guess what? Some of us are going to find ourselves in circumstances like Paul and Silas, possibly in circumstances worse than Paul and Silas. How is that going to affect us? If now, before we even are in these circumstances, we're wondering or complaining, murmuring, oh Lord, panic stricken, and what's going on? Or are we utilizing the time now to actually practice and using this weapon so that when it comes to the real crunch, when, when, when scenarios that some of us imagine in our mind and we, we go, oh Lord, you know, I, I don't know what's coming. I don't know if I'll be able to make it. I don't, I don't want to experience this. Lord, maybe I should die before this happens. Brothers and sisters, we need to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Here is a weapon. Let's practice now. If this now is troubling us, what will we do when, when, the real, when the real trouble hits? We're seeing glimpses of it. So that's one aspect, one component of the sword, like I said, two-edged sword, praise, thanks, uh, sorry, praise and singing to God. We see it in this particular story. The other edge of the sword of joyfulness, the other blade, the other, the other side, is expressed in Psalm 97. Let's look at this one uh, and see how we can put all of that together. Psalm 97 and verse 12. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. So the one blade was singing, praising. The other blade here of rejoicing is to give thanks. Now, giving thanks. Excuse me. Giving thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. So this giving thanks is linked here with remembering. Or in other words, if you forget, and forgetfulness will impact directly that uh, negatively, or if we remember positively, of course. Here's another one, uh, Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So here's the two components. Praise is linked here with thanksgiving. Entering into his gates. Now, this is, of course, spoken physically of, say, the temple. When you come into the temple, come and, come and worship God with an attitude of thanksgiving with praise in your lips this is how you enter but guess what spiritually as well this is how we enter into god's presence think about it god inhabits the praises of his people as you begin to praise as you begin to sing and as you give thanks thanksgiving gives you access into the very presence of god he inhabits the praises of his people this link occurs spiritually there is a link this is how you enter into god's presence so it's like a ticket, okay? It's like a ticket, somebody's checking the ticket at the gate. If you, if you are going to an event, you have a, a ticket, it gives you entrance. You don't have a ticket, sorry, you can't come in. Our ticket, brothers and sisters, so to speak, into entering into God's presence is praise and thanksgiving. I want to focus on thanksgiving here. Giving thanks. Giving thanks is by far one of the most underrated, underused aspects of uh, our spiritual battle. It, it, it's part of this package. You're seeing here, the joy of the Lord is, is, is a multifaceted thing. It's not just all oh, feeling happy. The joy of the Lord is strength because there is praise component we looked at and there is the thanksgiving component we're looking at. Giving of thanks. Too often, we give complaints. We give murmuring. We give what comes of our, our, our lips is an expression usually of the heart and the mind. Uh, it shows that what's in our mind is, is turmoil is anxiety. Rather than being thankful, we are anxious. What is our mindset? Well, someone put it well. It says, having an attitude of gratitude. Having an attitude of gratitude comes about from a remembrance of God's faithfulness, of God's holiness, a recognition that in your vision, who you're seeing above all else that, that outshines everything else is the Lord himself and the joy that is in the Lord. That's, that's what's in your field of vision. And if that's in, in your field of vision, then what will express is praise and 
thanksgiving, having this attitude of thanksgiving. So have you thanked God lately? Now, this is, a, this is a tricky one, I know, because some people say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. I'm going through a severe trial and, and heartache. How can I thank God? Uh, have you truly, genuinely thanked God? For example, now, it doesn't matter what circumstances it might be, because guess what? The Bible presents us with a picture, a very clear picture, that God is greater than whatever circumstance you might go through. Even if it's a go, I'm in prison, in jail. Uh, the, uh, Paul and Silas, the fact that they were singing was an expression of thankfulness, gratitude. They were thankful to God. And when they were thankful to God, that connected spiritually and, and a miracle happened. Have you been thankful to God? Doesn't matter what you're going through. For example, and I, and I mean that genuinely. I don't mean that just to, you know, as, as a verbal thing to express. Genuinely, have you truly been genuine, genuinely thankful to God? What about what's happening in the world today? I'm not saying thank God for the trouble. But, you know, are you thankful that you're actually living at such a time when we are seeing fulfilling prophecy and we know that the end is at hand? Uh, or are you fearful? Are you wishing, oh Lord, I, I, maybe I should rest before the, the, the rest of the, what, what comes next, what comes around the corner? I wonder what, what it'll be. And, and maybe God will do that for some of the elderly folk, you know, among us and so on. But are we truly thankful because we recognize that God is greater than whatever trouble or trial Satan might throw our way, even if we are in the midst of the trial right now? Thankfulness, gratitude, praise, and thanksgiving to God does wonders. Or are you the opposite? That's the question. Let's look at a few, a few texts to this end as well. First uh, Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Just how important is thanksgiving? Well, here it is right there. It is actually God's will. It is God's desire. In other words, what, what Paul is saying here, God wants us to just get it. God wants us to get and understand his will, his thinking. He wants us to get to that place where we recognize he is the one who is in control of our lives if we have given our lives to him. And as a result of that, we trust him that nothing will hit us or come our way or nothing we will experience or go through that is out of his hand or out of his vision or out of his planning or out of his, his knowledge. And we trust fully in him. And so it's his will for us that we give thanks in all things. God is basically saying, do you get it? Do you really get it? Do you really trust me no matter what? Do you trust me that I see what's going on and you give thanks? This is what it's talking about. It's a weapon. It's a mighty weapon. So in other words, it's an attitude of, you know, Satan, no problem. Give me your best shot, so to speak. And I don't say, I don't say this out of, you know, uh, callously and I don't say this flippantly. I say this out of a confidence in what Christ has accomplished. In other words, you have the victorious commander, Jesus Christ himself on your side. Satan, what can you do? Go for it. I have Jesus with me. And whatever Satan throws your way, you can say, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I know you're in control. I know it is your will for me to give thanks. And I give thanks to you at this moment because even though physically I can't see the outcome, I can't, everything is dark. I know you're in control and I know there is a better outcome and I trust you in that and you give thanks. Guess what? You know what? That might turn the battle right then and there. You realize that? So many times we miss out on that experience because we engage in, uh-oh, what's happening and, and so on and so forth. Giving thanks. That's how important it is. An attitude of gratitude, an attitude of recognizing God is our supreme provider. And he says, there is nothing that you will lack. I've got, I've got my eye on you. And you know what? This is the beautiful thing. We have, we have so much to be thankful for. God says, listen, no matter what happens, even should you die, I've got that covered. I've got that soul sorted already. Jesus is the resurrection of life. Because you think, what's the worst thing that could happen? You lose life? Or, and or all the other things, you know, lesser things, you lose, pain, suffering, turmoil, heartache, distress, whatever, until you even lose life itself. That's what we, that's what everybody tries to protect the most, generally, most people. That's what everybody, that's what drives the fear of everyone, fear of catching the virus, fear of this, fear of that, because it somehow will affect life and shorten it, if not diminish it and eliminate it altogether. So God says, listen, you know, they can p kill the body, they can't kill the soul. God is, God, God's the only one who can do that. And if, 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 it so happens that you die, no problem. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. So when you recognize that, whatever you might go through, say, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the outcome, the supernatural outcome that will happen that I don't know yet, but you're in charge and I trust you and I know you will do something amazing. Thank you. Praise God. And you begin to praise God and give thanks. Guess what? The forces of darkness now are thrown into confusion. Satan says, what? What? He's praising. He's she's singing. He's praising God. He's giving thanks. What? And the forces of darkness are confused. 
I'm talking to you about spiritual battle, brothers and sisters. We got to be skillful. We, we're going into a very serious battle coming up, and our weapons are rusty, to be quite honest. Okay, you know, I'm gonna check check your gear, like the people in uh, people in the army. They check their guns and oil, everything ready for battle. Uh, how how is you, how are your weapons? Well, weapons are rusty, and, and oh, I'm not used to this this thing. You know, my hand is sore. If this is heavy, or I'm just using a metaphor. Are we experts in utilizing the weapons now, while the going is good and easy? Because guess what? This is good and easy. So that when the going gets tough, we can skillfully say, yes, Lord, we're good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We give thanks and praise to God in everything. That's God's will. Now, it's not the only thing. I'll look at another verse in relation to this, because just to show how important Thanksgiving is, it's not just, you know, uh, a pep talk. This is not just a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Self-help, uh, you know, type of advice, you know, get just, just, you know, be positive and all be well. No, there is a reason and there is an underlying uh, purpose for this. It's because of the joy of the Lord. It's not just you, you think uh, happy, good thoughts and all will be well. No, you're trusting in someone who's in charge of your life. It's a big difference. So I don't want to just mistake this to be a pep talk and yeah, just be positive and all will be well and attract good things by thinking positive thoughts. No, there is trials for God's people. You know, Paul and Silas didn't avoid jail because they thought positive thoughts of freedom. They went to jail, but God delivered them from the jail because they used that spiritual weapon. So here's how important it is. First Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. So God's will is to give thanks in all things, like we just read earlier. And God's will is our sanctification. Well, guess what? The two are actually linked. Sanctification, holiness, is linked with giving thanks. In other words, holy people are thankful people, joyful people, praise, uh, God, uh, praising God people. That has to do with our sanctification. Holy people are not depressed, sad people, complaining people, murmuring people. The, Paul links it in the same letter, in the, sa uh, in the same book. He links the two. God's will is to give thanks. God's will is your sanctification. The two are linked. Are we fulfilling God's will? Many, many examples uh, in the scriptures we could use, but I'm challenging you and me. How is our journey? How is our attitude? Are we truly, genuinely praising God indeed, thankful, trusting him no matter what? And look, I know the prospect is bleak. I am well aware of that. Look, especially if you have children today and you hear things about what the government wants want to do and, and so on and so forth, that the prospect can be really bleak and fear and panic can set in and, oh Lord, what's going to happen? What are we going to do? Maybe we should run to the country. Maybe we should find a place or I don't know what... This is all good and well. Do what you need to do. But if this is what occupies your entire field of vision, and as a result of that, you lose the joy of the Lord, then, I have, then you're, you're in serious trouble. I have bad news for you. You're in very serious trouble. Brothers and sisters, God is greater than whatever will come upon us in this world. And he's, he, his eye is on us. Let us be trusting. Let us indeed give him our praise, our genuine heartfelt thanksgiving, even if it doesn't feel like it now in the physical realm to our human vision. And watch what will happen. This is how we can engage in the events that are happening in the world. This is how we can fight back. Not by signing petitions, not by doing play, signs and placards and going and protesting. That's not how we fight the, the trouble that's in the world. We fight using the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but mighty through God. our spiritual weapons. This is a mighty weapon. Joy, praise and thanksgiving, the two edges of that. So, how is it with you? How is it with me? No wonder the Bible says time and again, rejoice in the Lord always. Again. I say rejoice. Why, why is Paul saying that? And again, I say rejoice. Why? Because there's going to be every temptation to give that up, to forget about that. There's plenty of reasons for us to be joyful. Some people say, well, you know, that's easy for you to say. You're having a nice time, easy time. If someone is going through an easy time, yeah, I can think of something to be joyful. But I'm going through a hard time. You know, what, what can I be joyful about? You know, it, it depends on where you are looking. It really depends on what occupies your mind. Uh, I want to use one example, one illustration here of David, and I know our time is running quickly, so I want to speed up. Uh, David and how he, uh, when he sinned with Bathsheba, this is his prayer of confession, Psalm 51 and verse 12. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David wanted the joy of salvation to be restored to him. Aren't you glad that we have salvation? Not that we will one day have salvation, we have it in Christ. Aren't you glad that the Lord called you from darkness into his marvelous light? Aren't you thankful that what you used to be, you're not anymore, and that you are now someone new, a new creature in Christ, and you have a promise of eternal life? 
a promise that whatever trouble is happening in the world today, it will not last, it will pass away, it's only temporary, that eternity with the Lord, is, there is no pain, there's no suffering, there's no death, there's no trial, there's nothing of the sort. It is true, genuine joy and gladness in the physical presence of the Lord. Isn't that something to be glad about? Isn't that something to give thanks about? Isn't that something to rejoice about in the midst of darkness? This is spiritual battle, brothers and sisters. Spiritual battle, one on one. This is the basics of spiritual warfare. And yet, many times, in the basics, it seems like we are remiss, and then we hope to make it through the advanced levels. Let's make sure we are well equipped for the battle ahead of us. David wanted that joy restored. So he sinned, he lost it, he wanted that joy restored to him. Now notice the connection here, because in the next verse, there is a, there is a very powerful reason uh, why he wanted that. Verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Joy, the joy of the Lord is strength. Joy is strength. When I say joy is strength, it's not just strength as in physical power in this area. Sometimes it actually has that effect. But joy is strength in every kind of aspect that we don't even think about. Here we see very clearly the joy of salvation that David wanted restored to him will give him the ability to teach transgressors his ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What's that? Witnessing power. Witnessing power. Sharing the truth with others. Power to share that with others. According to David here, is dependent and based on having the joy of God's salvation restored to him. So I want to put all that together here in a practical way. And sometimes we try and share the truth with others and we wonder, you know, why don't they accept? And it's, it's, it's very helpful sometimes to really consider, what do they see? What's their vision of us? What do we present to them? Are we presenting to them a walk with Jesus that is joyful, happy? That's why I said earlier, you know, what's, what's your reputation? How do people know you? What do people think of when, when they say, oh, this brother or this sister? Do they think of you in, in which light? Grateful, thankful, joyful, uh, praise, uh, you know, praise, not praiseworthy, but you know, someone who praises God like? Or do they think of you, oh, yeah, this brother always complains, moans, groans. Or, yeah, he, he has some, some interesting things as far as the theory of truth, but, oh, you know, his, his attitude and, uh, yeah, I'm not so sure. Because... Many times, our witnessing power and ability, brothers and sisters, is diminished because we don't do it in the power of the Lord. We do it in our own power. We try and share the truth with someone as, an, as a theory, as some ideas. And if, if we examine our attitude as far as what we reveal to them, and we wonder why they don't join us, why they don't accept us, maybe they don't want to be, end up having a miserable walk like they see us having. No matter how much truth we're expressing theoretically, we might be undoing all of that in other words doing it weekly because we're not doing it with the joy of the lord and this is not something manufactured i'm not trying to say do it with your joy like this you know pep talk and uh, uh, self-help people who do it in the world i'm talking about the joy of the lord true witnessing power is part of the joy of the lord david wanted that you want more power in your witnessing guess what where are you looking Look to the presence of Jesus. Receive it fully. Be joyful in his presence. And you will experience power in witnessing. You don't want to be, people don't want to be converted to a miserable Christian experience based on what they're seeing in you. Too many times we are the greatest obstacle in the way of people accepting the truth. And we wonder because we think sharing the truth is just sharing ideas with them. Why don't I accept their, my ideas? It's not just that, brothers and sisters. Joy is actually a fruit of the spirit. Uh, the the early church, the church in the, in the book of Acts, was actually uh, expressed, or it said many times, that they were full of joy. I just want to use one verse from here uh, to recount the Acts 13, verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Here's the early church. Here's the scripture from the early church. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, witnessing power. Say, oh, yeah, I need the power of the Spirit witnessing. What's one characteristic that's actually identified? They were joyful. They were happy. They actually had an attitude and a spirit that attracted people to the truth that they were professing. They attract, it attracted people to Jesus in whose presence is fullness of joy. Are we really attracting people to Jesus and giving them the idea and the true impression that in his presence is fullness of joy? Or are we showing them that in his presence is misery, heartache, complaining, sadness? And it, it makes a huge difference, brothers and sisters. That's what we're talking about. There is, there is a final component I don't want to miss because it's part of this, uh, of this picture that we're looking at here. So this was the experience of the early church. And like I said, uh, joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, joy. Then peace, gentleness, good, uh, goodness, long-suffering, and so on and so forth. Joy is one of those components that is so undervalued and underestimated. People in the world actually use it. And that's the human manufactured joy. They use it to great success and accomplish things in the human realm. 
And we spiritually fail in using it when ours, because it's in the presence of the Lord, it's the joy of Jesus himself, is so much more powerful. It actually accomplishes success, not just physically in the world, but it accomplishes it spiritually. We fight Satan with this joy. <laughs> Satan's going to have a hard, confusing time when he deals with a joyful, praising, singing, thankful Christian who's going through trouble. That, that just is under Satan. Now, I'm not saying, you know, uh, uh, you know ignore the, the obvious and, and pretend what you're not experiencing or feeling. I'm saying look to Jesus more in those dark times. And it, at the beginning, it might not feel like it. It, you, you, it might go against your feelings, your emotions. But persevere and sing out loud. Sing when you don't feel like it. Praise God. Give thanks. And watch the battle turn. The battle for the mind spiritually is won, brothers and sisters, many times by just where we are looking. Where are you looking? Joy is a very powerful thing. So we saw it in the early church, like I said. Uh, the final component, and I, I'll, I'll close with this, just a couple of verses here. Let's look at that. And... Uh, We'll make it a bit more practical, hopefully. Proverbs 17, verse 22. Here it is. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. That's why God wants us to be joyful. There is power. There is health power, healing power in joy. So the joy of the Lord is strength. It's not just strength, you know, spiritual. It's not just strength for witnessing, but strength of health, strength of uh, vitality and vigor. As it says here, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You know, we talk a lot about uh, natural remedies. Here is a, here is a, <laughs> a heaven prescribed natural remedy, a merry heart. It's, it's good like medicine. If you don't even buy it in a bottle or a tincture, you know, it's a merry heart. It's an attitude, an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of praise, of thanksgiving, of joy will do wonders like medicine. And this will affect your health as well, not just, uh, you know, spiritual health. Physical health as well. It has an impact. You know, we're actually told that a large degree, uh, a large percentage of diseases are from the mind. They stem from the mind. What is our attitude like? Brothers and sisters, the coming battle coming upon us is one that is actually over the mind. It's not just an external battle, physical, who will come, who will take us, where will they put, what will they put in us, what will they implant in us, and where will we get? It's, the, the coming battle is a battle primarily up here. All these external physical things are going to be an assault on here. How are you doing here? What is your attitude? How is your spirit? Where is your rock? What shakes it? What moves it? Or are you steadfast? Is the joy of the Lord manifest in your experience? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So let us give each other some of this medicine, brothers and sisters. A merry heart. Now I wanted to link this with another verse, and we'll close with this one. And uh, here it is. Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. So a merry heart does good like a medicine. Let's, let's take this medicine. Let's give this medicine to each other. A joyful Christian. Uh, joy really is the strength of, of any relationship, if you think about it. Joy, joy is, is a, it just makes relationships beautiful. You know, you have a relationship, but you have, have joy, share joy. And joy is shared. Joy, joy is very infectious. But here it says that this merry heart makes what? A cheerful countenance. What does that mean? That means it will have an impact physically. So it's not just an attitude, the spirit you have. It will impact if true, genuine, biblical joy in the presence of the Lord will manifest in your appearance, in your face, will make for a cheerful countenance. In other words, a Christian is not, you know, I'm miserable because I hope I make it to heaven, you know. Like I'll, I'll, I'll obey the Lord even if it kills me. I'm going to do this uh, health diet even if it kills me. I heard that many times. Uh, you know, look, a, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. Brothers and sisters, how are you? How am I? Is the joy of the Lord reflected in our countenance? You know, we, you, can, you can have witnessing power without opening your lips. Without, before you speak, you can be witnessing. What are we showing? What are we manifesting? The joy of the Lord? Or what's really written on our countenance? So I want to I wanna challenge you with this. That's why we are to be strong in the Lord. That's why we're told rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I want to I wanna read a little poem to that effect. And I'll close with this beautiful little poem. I thought it was so clever. And I want to read it especially because today we have a, a, a virus that's spreading and infections are everywhere. People are wearing masks. 
so you can't even smile through through a mask un unfortunately wherever if you're wearing a mask in, in your particular area but uh, these people are worried about this this infection this disease and what's going to happen and, and and so on and so forth let me let me share this little poem with you and it goes like this smiling is infectious you catch it like the flu when someone smiled at me today i started smiling too i passed around the corner and someone saw my grin when he smiled i realized i passed it on to him I thought about that smile, then I realized its worth. A single smile, just like mine, could travel the earth. So if you feel a smile begin, don't leave it undetected. Let's start an epidemic quick and get the world infected. Isn't that summed up beautifully? Let us spread an infection of joy, brothers and sisters, an infection of thankfulness, an infection of praise. There's enough troubled heartache that is spreading like I said, faster and more than the virus. Let us spread that which the Lord has blessed us with. You know, and you can see it. You, you walk in the street. You walk in the street. <laughs> just as an experiment. Just do it. Smile at people, they smile back. You don't smile at people, they don't smile back. Sometimes, you know, it's a bit hard to make eye contact. But when you do, and you do it intentionally. I do it sometimes, you know, at the market, there's lots of people. And I look at people and then I intentionally smile. So it's like I saw them and then I smile. And guess what? They smile. So that's, it's infectious. Brothers and sisters, we have a mighty weapon in our hands, the joy of the Lord. Let's look to the Lord. Let's be lightened by his presence. Let's enter into his courts with thanksgiving and, and praise. Let him inhabit our praises. Let us fight manfully this battle. Let us practice while the going now is good and easy for that which is coming ahead. Let us confuse the forces of darkness because our bond with Christ is so strong. It's so intimate. It's so filling us with joy that there is nothing that Satan can throw at us that will alter or change or detract from that or that will cause us to separate from Christ. This is the challenge. So I'll leave it at that. Let's close with a word of prayer and let us be joyful together as we ask and thank the Lord for what we covered to, uh, so far. So I'll ask you to bow your heads with me if you are able. Father, we are indeed so thankful that we have been given all things. There is just so much that we could recount and relate of the blessings that we receive day by day that that we become so accustomed to that we just take for granted we thank you so much that in the midst of darkness and death and sin you have given us true and real hope and life and joy in jesus we thank you for every breath we draw we thank you for this time we thank you for this reminder and i just pray that your spirit will be poured out in each heart that you will encourage our hearts, our souls, especially those of us who are struggling, who are going through a trial, whether it be loss of a loved one, whether it be loss of uh, assurance, loss of income, lo whatever it might be, health, uh, anxiety, whatever we're going through, help us to remember, Lord, that we have a compassionate Savior who knows and sees and has promised us that this is not the end of the story, that this is not what will last forever, but that we can look forward with joy and hope and assurance and trust you in all things. So we thank you for all these promises. We thank you that you have blessed us all today and we commit, recommit ourselves to you. And we pray that you be with us for the coming approaching week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, turn notifications on, and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus. Thank you.